So Molly, you wrote in your book that the word chef makes you cringe in regards to your own title. Why? I'm just like not a chef anymore. And I was, I definitely self-identified as a chef when I was working in restaurants. And then I've spent so much of my like actual adult career honing the skill of learning how to really get in the head space of an amateur cook, like a home cook, mm -hmm. that I'm like no longer a chef. I feel like I'm just like a really badass home cook. And the word chef, like obviously I love chefs and I'm, I so appreciate what they bring to the world and to restaurants. But for me, like it suggests a like buttoned upness that I just don't possess and don't want to because I want to be really relatable to just like your average home cook trying to put a meal on the table. How did you come to this? Because most people are aspiring to the big title, the big yeah. job, and you're like, mm, I'm good with the opposite. I had like a real revelation when I got my first job working in food media, like at a food magazine. I had been working in restaurants for so long and eventually was like, I want to branch out. I want to see what this like food media situation is. Maybe I'll work at a food magazine. And I had a really tough transition actually because I brought like my chefiness into that mm. space and it was so not the space for it where like what you're supposed to do is or what like the most successful version of a recipe de developer is not one who's like pulling out all the bells and whistles because your average cook is like never going to succeed in that way. But I felt like a lot of pride around being a chef, having just like spent years and years in kitchens. And it was very humbling to then go into an environment mm -hmm. like the test kitchen that I was working in and have all of these like really talented, incredible cooks that weren't like chefy in the real like restauranty sense. And it really like, brought me down to earth. And I found a real appreciation for the skill of figuring out how to create truly delicious food that doesn't rely on like 17 steps and you know like overnight braises and reductions and micro this and molecular that and that it's almost harder to put something truly revelatory when you can't rely on all of those things yeah and so i took that as a challenge and kind of rejiggered my relationship to cooking to be one that was like seen through the eyes of a home cook. So in what I do, there's this guy, Bob Costas. He's like a famed news anchor, sportscaster. And years ago, I read that he said uh, the best interviewers, hosts know 100% of the information and use 25% of it on air. And totally. I thought that was nuts. And as I got older and got more comfortable in my skin, yeah. I understood what he meant. Yeah. But I'm in such admiration that you recognize that at such a young age. It sounds like you have like a really great sense of self. Yeah, that's an interesting way to put it. I think it is like, I know I can do all these things, but I feel like my job here is to like take all of that 100% and distill it down into like the most kind of easily digestible 25% for mm -hmm. like the larger population. Yeah, I think that's why so many people gravitate towards you. Well, one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. So for some families, food is a really big deal. Yeah. I did not grow up in a food family. Neither did I. Okay, so how did you come to food? It's crazy. I think that like, it, I feel like it's innate. Like you either like have a palate that is curious or not. And I think I was just born with a curious palate for starters, but it was really not until I was like out on my home, living outside of my family home on my own, feeding myself and then studying abroad and being exposed to food outside of what I had known my whole life that like kind of my world opened up and I was like, oh my God, what is cooking? This is insane. Mm -hmm. There's like such a crazy breadth of flavor and um, ways that food shows up in the world. And I think I just been a little bit Sheltered isn't the world isn't the word, but just sort of in my own space, in my own comfort zone with the food I grew up with, which was like totally fine and not exceptional. Sorry, mom. Sorry, dad. <laughs> and then I just like got out in the world and was like, oh, this is sick. Like there's so much to explore. Did you have friends at college that had a different palate? Like I remember the first time a friend showed me sushi. Like we didn't eat sushi in my house. Yeah, I definitely surrounded myself with people who were like also like my best friend in college was like obsessed with food also. And we actually 
kind of embarrassingly now as we look back on it, had a supper club in college where we would like turn our living room into a dining room and like our other best friend was the waitress and she would like check you in at the door. That's so cool. We would make like four course meals. So we were very, I was very exploratory during college, studied abroad, ate a lot, learned a lot. And then as soon as I left college and graduated, I was like, okay, this is it. I'm doing it for my career. And my degrees in art history, which has actually served me so well, How? I think. Um, just because like what I do now is so much more than just food and it's like a brand and it's really visual mm -hmm. and I show up in the world beyond just what's on the plate. And so having gone to school for something visual, like really I think informs all of that. It's funny, I was just having a conversation about this yesterday. Like I was like, we never talked about business. Like it was never like, honey, what are you gonna do? And how are you gonna build this? And it was, that was just not the conversation at the dinner table. I don't really remember what it was. I just know like, I wasn't being encouraged to like be a businesswoman. I was just being <laughs> encouraged to be me. And okay. so, I don't know, growing up in a creative home. Are just, there any rules? <laughs> My mom had some roles, um, but I was a pretty good girl, I would say. Mm -hmm. I like snuck out of the house once and it was a major drama, but beyond that, like, I was pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't break the rules. My brother, on the other hand, was like always breaking them. So like relative to him, I just looked like an angel. You mentioned a curious <laughs> palette. I'd never heard that term before. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if it's like a personality thing or a palette thing or like maybe where they intersect, but I think it has to do with like trying something new and then being like curious enough to like ask or find out more about it or want to like explore it or have it another time and not just like have the experience end right there. Yeah. Do you feel like you have a curious palette? So I've noticed that when I date people who have curious palates, mine becomes more curious. And I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. Like I never, I looked at few, food as fuel previously. Okay, and so now, we're the opposite. <laughs> yeah, no, but now I look but at now, it differently yeah, and I'm totally. so interested. And I think it's, it's an art and a science. Yeah, totally. It's a little bit of both. So how can somebody um, refine their palate? Like, is it just by eating out at restaurants? Is it, what do you think it is? I think it is, it's about paying attention. And so it's so easy to move about the day, the week, the month, the year, just eating and not really like stepping back and taking kind of clocking what's actually going into your body and thinking about how it tastes and like what it reminds you of. And is it similar to this? And like, how did the texture improve or take away from the dish? It's about self-reflection and like in the same way that it's important to spend time with yourself just mm -hmm. Being with yourself, thinking about yourself, you know, mental health is so important. Like, I feel like eating can be that as well. And so many people just like rush right through it to get like through the meal or to the next thing. And I feel like developing a palate is like slowing down and like thinking about what you're eating. That's so well said. Thank you. <laughs> I think when I started thinking of food as art, as um, nourishment, yeah. that like the self care aspect of food is really big. Cause when you talked about making your own food in college, I yeah. hear like a sense of pride. Like I know how to feed myself. Totally. I didn't know how to feed myself either. Yeah, I think one thing that has really fueled like everything I do and my career is this sort of innate fear that I have about our, my generation or just sort of the world we live in that we could get to a place where most people don't know how to put like even the simplest meal on the table mm -hmm. because it's so easy to get a delicious meal via takeout or Postmates or Uber Eat or go out to a restaurant, which by all means, like we need to keep those afloat and restaurants are such an important part of my life. But I worry that like modern conveniences will make home cooking kind of obsolete. And there's just nothing to me that can replace like the feeling of sitting down like in a actual home and not a restaurant that's meant to look like a home mm -hmm. and eating, whether it's something that you cooked or a family member, like even if it's not as yummy as what you had at that like Michelin starred, whatever, it tastes better because like you're so enveloped in like an experience of coziness and warmth and whatever. And so I think that has driven so much of what I do. Yeah, I like the idea of food as love and I think that's what you're talking about. 100% and like we could lose cool. that and that would be a bummer. You seem like a trial by fire person to me. Yeah. I was laughing when I was listening to a lot of your podcasts because 
people are asking you these like very chefy questions and you're mm -hmm. like, well, I worked in a kitchen and it was insane. Yeah. And so I was like, yeah, I'm out. Yeah. And then you just went on to this sort of job that felt like um, you had sort of dreamed about it even before you knew it existed. Yeah. I'm definitely someone who's like open to exploring things. So I think when I realized that I had a passion for food and wanted to make a career of it, I was like, well, I have to learn how to cook because I'm going to have like no credibility in this world if I don't learn how mm -hmm. to cook. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to go work in a restaurant. I have no idea what I'm doing. I honestly, to this day, don't know why I got hired because in retrospect, like I was a total mess. I remember the first time that I, like day one, working the line in a restaurant, the chef must have seen something in me, I don't know. And he was like, I was like shadowing the line cook on the line. And he was like, hey Molly, pick up the chicken. And I was like, okay, okay. And I opened up the oven and there was like a chicken roasting in the oven in a skillet at 450 degrees. And I was like, I don't have, what, where's the like, I don't have an oven mitt. Like, could mm -hmm. someone get me an oven mitt? And they just like looked at me like, we don't use oven mitts in kitchens. We use like side towels and rags. And like, I didn't know, I, I, I didn't even know what to do. I was like, how do I get the chicken out of the oven? Like, yeah. I'm gonna burn myself. It was like Was this that, at that. the Boston restaurant? Yeah, at the Beacon Hill Bistro. And someone passed me a side towel, which is like a dish towel. And I was like, okay, got it. Like, keep side towels on. It's <laughs> yeah. so like, I was a mess. But I knew that being put into that environment would teach me like so much faster than I than like going to cooking school and having like a formal but like slower education. And I think I'm kind of like a let's get to the point kind of person. So after the Beacon Hill Bistro, you went on to a Brooklyn restaurant that was um, like high end food, yeah? So I did or... Beacon Hill Bistro to then I went into fine dining in Manhattan. So I went to this restaurant called Picheline. Ooh. And that was like very oh, like 14 course tasting menu, super like French brigade system kitchen, like very classic what you expect mm -hmm. um, when you think about like a gnarly kitchen. And I worked there for like a year and like cried every day in the bathroom, <laughs> but was like, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna learn everything. And Everyone I, has a cry every day at yeah. work story. Yeah. yeah, that was mine. And I was like treated like absolute shit, but had the wherewithal to be like, this isn't forever. Like I'm learning so much. And then I went to Brooklyn and I worked at um, this like British gastro pub for a year. And then I worked at this restaurant called The Glassery, mm -hmm. which I don't know if you've been to Kismet here, but mm -hmm. the same chefs, Sarah and Sarah, who opened Kismet, ran the restaurant, were the chefs of the restaurant in Brooklyn that I last worked at. So I heard you talk about this because you said it was the first time you worked for a woman. Yes. And it True. was a completely different experience. Yeah, like way more sensitive and emotional and like harder and better all at the same time. Why harder? Harder because like I felt like there was a lot of women in the kitchen. It was like pretty much all women. Um, I was like scared to hurt feelings and feelings got hurt. And you know, a restaurant is like such an intense, mm -hmm. high stress environment that it's like easy for things to snap and like miscommunications to happen and people to feel unsupported. And so it was like emotionally challenging and then also like f felt so good to be able to like be a woman in a restaurant and like not have to hide the fact that you like have emotions and are sensitive and like your feelings might get hurt if like someone doesn't hold you down on prep, you know? Yeah. So it was a bit of both. Do you feel like now that you work for yourself, you get to be who you fully are? 100% and that's the greatest like joy I have every day is like, I feel like I have people around me who celebrate me and that's why they're around me because I'm like mm -hmm. I feel I feel seen by the people I work with and really supported and like I can be vulnerable with them and like disappointed in things and not feel like I'm being like a Debbie Downer and I can mm -hmm. also be like kind of a dumbass when I need to and I'm not being judged mm -hmm. and when it's like when I run the show and I'm choosing who those people are that like make me feel safe and good that feels really incredible, you know? There's this guy, Matt Higgins, who I had on the podcast. He's um, in like the VC world and he was a guest on Shark Tank. And he said when he was looking for a life partner, mm -hmm. it was the same as when he was looking for employees. And it was like, people That's will say- so like VC energy. <laughs> <laughs> but I liked what he said. He said um, that everybody will tell you, like find somebody who like really brings you down to earth, who mm -hmm. like keeps you grounded as yourself. And he was like, the whole world keeps me grounded. Mm -hmm. I want someone who can show me I can fly. 
And I was like, yes, that energy. Oh my God, that 100. And yeah. it's the same with people you work with. Totally. I, my agent and my manager both are that. Like, That's awesome. My agent is a woman named Nicole, my manager, Ben, and they like will do anything for me. And like, I know how deeply they love me and feel me and like know who I am in the world and can help me navigate it when I'm like, this is the first time I'm ever doing X, Y, or Z. Yeah. So I feel like they do exactly that for me. Speaking of first times, you work at these restaurants, yeah. and then all of a sudden, you start doing work at Bon Appetit. Yeah. And I love the story you tell, because you were like, I worked there like one day a week, and I thought that was it. Yeah. Like, I had it. I was actually working at Epicurious, which is like the sister company. So it's like the digital sister brand to Bon Appetit. But it was right next door okay. on the same floor as Bon Appetit. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna get in here. And I recipe tested like once a week and I would just like sneak into the Bon Appetit test kitchen, which just had these like big windows on the world downtown in New York. And I definitely think that, and I guess this is something that's good about me. Like I felt so proud of myself for having even gotten in the door there mm -hmm. um, that I was like, th I'm peaking. Like this is, as high as I can possibly go. I'm working for like a major food publication. It was Epicurious, but then I started working like little by little for BA. But being a recipe tester, which means like I wasn't doing anything actually creative. I was helping just test other people's recipes mm -hmm. and making sure that they like function properly. But no one was saying like, Molly, what do you want to cook mm -hmm. at all? And then I started food styling for them and it was the same thing. It was like making other people's food look good. But still I was like, oh my God, I've made it, I've made it, I've made it. And then just like kind of kept getting better. And then at one point they were like, do you want to develop a recipe? And I was like, um, yeah. And then from there it was, do you want to just like maybe try being on camera? You can like, shoot a video and we'll see how it goes. And I just like, I just, I had died and gone to heaven. Yeah, and you just, you set your sights on it. Yeah, I, that is one thing that people say, or like my, my best friend, Rachel, always says, she's like, you are a manifester. Like, mm. you know what you want and like, you say it and then like, you f manifest it. And it doesn't mean that you're like, forcing through, trudging through things, but like for whatever reason, like the energy you put in the world, like manifests the things that you want. And so I feel like it kind of manifested that whole job for myself. I also like asked for the job. Um, right. But you got to do a lot of manifesting also. How did you manifest the next phase? So like the cookbook and like going out into my own phase? Yeah, because you leave BA yeah. and you've never worked for yourself before. And no. kitchens are very structured places. Yeah. Do not be late, show up at this time. And like everything is kind of there for you. Yeah. Honestly, I think I wouldn't have been able to manifest this second phase of my career where like I am my own boss. Mm -hmm if I hadn't been given the vote of confidence from my cookbook publisher initially, like I got an email out of the blue from them when they were first interested in working together. And it was like the dream email to receive that was like, you, I saw the um, Penguin Random House, like as the, that penguinrandomhouse.com. And it was like from this woman, Jen, I didn't know who Jen was at the time. She's now my editor. But I just remember being like, oh my God, like I've. I have died and gone to heaven. I got the email from like the publishing house. And, and they reached out to you. They reached out to me. Cause Which they had like huge. seen me on camera at Bon Appetit and they probably were like, it's a rising star energy. But it's very different energy when you reach out to them versus when they reach out to you. Totally different. And so that's what I mean that like, they really gave me the confidence to like look at myself in a different way. Mm -hmm. So at, to this point, I had been so like kind of at the service of the company I was working for and still sort of in disbelief that I'd even gotten as far as I had in my career and certainly didn't think that anyone was going to be like, and now like, let's, it's the Molly show. What cookbook do you want to write? Mm -hmm. So when I, after many conversations with them, finally got my first book deal, that was just going to be like the Molly Boz cookbook. I think that was like a, really pivotal shift in the way I perceived myself and my like value to the world and my ability to like create something entirely my own that no one else was helping like curate for me. Like all of the work I did at Bon Appetit Magazine was like 
to develop recipes for a specific story that the magazine wanted to tell. And now I had this chance to write a book that was just like, what story and food do I want to tell? Or like, what do I feel like the world needs to learn about cooking? Mm -hmm. Just from my perspective, period, like nothing beyond that. And that I feel like was the moment. And you had you worked with designers who had never done cookbook layouts before. Yeah. Why did you make that choice? Both times, actually. So for my first book, yeah, I hired a French design team called Violaine et Jeremy. And then the second time around with this book, Play Lab, which is an agency, creative agency here in LA. And I was very intentional about that because, and kind of with everything I do, I'm like, I don't want to look like the spitting image of a of a cookbook or a recipe developer or like chef or whatever it is that like people might call me. I want to do it like my way in a way that feels unique. And I felt like hiring a design team that had done a million cookbooks before, they would have this idea of what a cookbook is supposed to look like mm -hmm. and how a recipe is supposed to be laid out. And I was like, I don't want anyone to come in with preconceived notions about that. I want to like rethink it all. And I feel like as a result, the book, like both of them look, you know, the insides look like cookbooks and on the outside, they're like, is it a cookbook? Is it an art book? Like, what is it? Mm -hmm. And I like that sort of ambiguity. Do you miss the adrenaline of working in a kitchen at all? Yes, big time. Like that's definitely the biggest loss, I think. Do you get it elsewhere? Are you skydiving? What's happening? No, not really. <laughs> like I'm like running on the treadmill and being like, way to go. But like... <laughs> I don't have it baked into my life in the same way. I, I don't honestly can't think when the last time I had like an adrenaline rush akin to getting through service. The was. stakes are so high. I was a waitress yeah. at an Italian restaurant and it was a Friday night, which is busy. Yeah. And somebody ordered like the broiled chicken and I forgot to put it in. And that's like a 45 minute wait if you don't put the chicken in. Yeah. I I still to this day I feel PTSD. Yeah. That sort of it's your whole angst body. I haven't felt in any other career. Yeah, like totally. the kitchens are insane. Yeah. I think like and it's like the bad comes with the good. Like the good part of that is like it's exhilarating and you like experience like a whole roller coaster of emotions every day you go to work, which yeah. is like no better way to feel alive. And then also like it's terrible because no better like, way to bad, have a heart attack. Yeah. Like the 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 bads are really bad, you know? Yeah. Um, and so now like things are mellow-ish um, in my kitchen. I'm fascinated by this concept and I'm so curious about your pulse on this. It seems like so much of your career has come from just a place of yes. Mm -hmm. How do you now at this stage determine when you say yes versus when you say no? Very easily. And I think I figured this out kind of right when I was building this second chapter of my life, which is my career on my own. I out, I have outlined for myself what sort of my purpose is here as far as what my what like I want to do in, and accomplish in my career. And the purpose is I want to teach people how to cook. I want to make it easier for people to eat deliciously in the comfort of their own homes. And I want people to like find the joy in it mm -hmm. where it can otherwise be stressful. And so as opportunities come my way, they're all basically filtered through that lens of like, am I getting closer to my goal? Like, am I landing one more meal on somebody's table? And so if that's through starting a recipe club, knowing that like I'm disseminating my recipes out into the world, taking cookbook deals, starting a wine company, because I'm like, I want people to be able to drink delicious wine, all of, all of the opportunities that are coming my way get filtered through that system. And it's like then very easy to be like, you know. I really like that. So do you ever like, you'll have an opportunity come your way and then look at your purpose, like read it on your computer and say. 100, I mean, it's in my head because I yeah. know it so well. But my manager also like very much knows that that's sort of the North Star. Hmm. And so it's a conversation that we're constantly having. Does the purpose ever evolve for you or is it pretty? It's been the same. Yeah. It's always been that. And you know, like it can kind of take on different forms. Like there's a very literal way to interpret it, which is like, did I deliver a recipe to someone? Right. And then there's like, did I deliver on the like experience of creating joy around eating, cooking, making it less stressful, making it more fun, less serious, more casual. That's sort of like the broader goal and objective. And a lot of things will 
filter into that. Yeah. You said it's exhausting to work for yourself. But you've also said that you've never felt burnout like when you were in a kitchen. Yeah. Where do you stand now? I feel momentary fleeting burn moments of burnout. Yeah. Like right now I am like pretty close to be honest. I'm like gearing up for my book tour which is happening in like three weeks and looking at my schedule like kind of gives me hives because there's just like so many asks from so many people but it's all also such incredible opportunity and I'm like so excited to do every single one of them that I, I take so much on. Burnout and I, the term burnout's a lot but exhaustion on your own terms is better than exhaustion on someone else's terms. Totally and I think it I is. know I have a pretty good sense of like where my limits are mm -hmm. and can manage like even though my schedule is like totally bonkers right now and like for most people it would just be like absurd to even like entertain the idea of taking on another photo shoot next week which I'm going to do <laughs> I can feel when I'm like gonna snap and I never let it get there yeah. um and yeah so I say yes to a lot of things but I'm so invigorated by what I do that like that oftentimes really outweighs any like sense of burnout. How do you balance it with a partner? And I'm going to use the word nourishment because we're talking about food, but like yeah. you're nourishing your business. Yeah. You're nourishing yourself. Yeah. At a moment of exhaustion. Like yeah. I know being a wife is really important to you too. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought it up because in our conversation yesterday, you were asking like what's a failure or what's something that you failed at? And what I came up with involves this exactly. I really oftentimes put my career and all of the chaos and moving parts of it first mm -hmm. and to like the detriment of like my family life. And that could be like, whether it be with regards to my partner or like staying in touch with my p parents on the other side of the country or making time for friends that I haven't seen or talked to in a long time. Like, the pace of life feels so fast to me right now. And I'm really, really working on slowing that down and finding balance. Um, I started working with a life coach recently who has like totally kind of shifted the paradigm for me and hmm. helped me realize that like sprinting to the finish line isn't the most graceful way to go about building something as big as I want to build and that there is something to be said for slowing it down and like relishing in every moment of it a bit more so that it doesn't just like whiz by you mm -hmm. and in doing so allow you to make space and time for people who like you would regret so deeply having not made time for if you got to the other end and looked back and were like oh shit yeah um and so that's something that has troubled me in the past because it's so hard to slow down when there's so much momentum and that I'm like constantly working on. That I resonate with that so deeply. Yeah. I appreciate your honesty. Yeah. Yeah. It's exhausting. Yeah. Your first cookbook is called Cook This Book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all about essentials. Yeah. And you say you simply need to set yourself up for success in the kitchen in order to truly enjoy it. Totally. I'm going to be really honest with you right now. Not only do I feel totally inept in the kitchen, but I do not enjoy it. Okay. Why don't you enjoy it? Part of it is that I, do, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Yep. The other part is I live in like a one bedroom apartment in West Hollywood. So my kitchen's a little like, yeah. it's hard to move around. Yep. And similar to what you said, it's so easy to order sweet greens yep. and have a delicious meal. Yeah. I'm nervous I'm going to have kids one day and not know how to feed them. <laughs> I'm nervous for you too. That's literally like why I'm here. It's like, I know. I'm like, I'm nervous for people like us. I, this is sort of like what my whole philosophy boils down to, which is that if it's not fun, you're never going to pick it up and do it. It's yes. going to be the last thing that you want to do. And you're going to find a million reasons why tonight is not the night to cook a meal. And so my whole sort of like theory on cooking is that like, it is my job to break down the barriers to entry for someone like you, to deliver a meal that can be made in a kitchen with like sizing constraints and that doesn't use like 700 pots and pans so that you're not like super annoyed that you have to do all the dishes afterwards and to deliver the like message of it and the language around it and the direction in a way that is like lighthearted and playful mm -hmm. and like 
uses goofy words so that I can signal to you that like, it's just not that deep. Yes. It's not that serious. And I don't have to Google the words you're using. Totally. They're yeah. colloquial. And I think that's like the ticket to enjoying it. And so. So more is more, which is your new yeah. cookbook. I can, will you grab it? Cause it's so yeah. pretty. I want to show everybody. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> more is more. Yeah. This is really well designed and I love the red. Okay. But if I pick up more is more, yeah. you're saying I can sift through it and like go to the grocery store and I could do this. 1000%. So <laughs> this book was made with like every average national grocery store in mind. So like, it's not going to call for something that you're going to special order online. That's for sure. This looks so good. So good. A piece of fish, some potatoes, some lemons, some parsley, some walnuts. Like I love how you mix cultures too. Yeah. Like I see some Asian fusion There's here. There's a lot. Yeah. I mean, I, I pull from like all of my eating experiences, I feel like. The other thing is that this little guy yeah. is, his name is Leroy the Lemon, I named him. And he signifies a recipe that's like super quick. So when it says really? quick as heck. Yeah. So like this one probably takes 15 minutes. So you Me can like- Me and Leroy are friends. Yeah, that's your homie. <laughs> Um, and so there are like little things throughout the book oh, that help you this. sort through it. So part of me feels like you're such a less is more person. So mm -hmm. why title it more is more? My feeling is that sort of what sets apart a really amateur novice cook from a professional one is this ability. <laughs> yeah. You from me is this ability to sort of like take control of your kitchen and just like go for it and like throw in some herbs and squeeze some lemon juice in there and season with your hands and lose the measuring spoons and that it's like a more is more mentality of like, go for it, taste as you go, keep adding, keep tasting, like no timidity, not, we're not doing like a little bit of pepper flakes, like let's taste it, let's learn what our limitations are. And so it's like maximalist is maybe not the right word, but like a- No um, fear of failure. Yeah, it's having, it's being fearless, it's being confident in yourself and knowing that like you are going to fuck it up occasionally, but like you're gonna learn so much from that mistake that it will pay off in the long run because you'll never do that again and you'll like learn something about it. And so it's just like, it's about like, just like going the extra mile. Yeah. So I know you always carry a tiny tin of mald, is it mald? Malden, yeah. Malden flaky sea salt in your bag. Yeah. And then I saw your tattoo and yeah. it's also, uh, indicates the salt. The love of salt. What is it? Um, I think for me, the maybe first thing that any cook needs to learn how to do is season properly. Food does not taste like, or ingredients do not taste like themselves until they are seasoned. Okay. So like a boiled potato can be a totally glorious thing on its own if the water has been properly seasoned. No. And if it hasn't, it just tastes like starch, like chalky waxy starch with like nothing pulling out. It's like very natural innate essence. And mm. so for me, it's not like, I like salty food. It's like, I want everyone to taste food the way it's like meant to be tasted. And salt brings those inherent flavors out. It's, it's a multiplier cool. of flavor. Okay, so you did a podcast all about sandwiches. Yeah, it was which so like fun. the whole podcast is about yeah. sandwiches. <laughs> so, I that's the one thing I can make. Can you build me the perfect sandwich right here on the spot? Yes. Um, yeah, I certainly can. So I think like the the glory of a great sandwich is a balance of like texture, fattiness, saltiness, and acid. And so there's a reason that the like Italian hoagie is sort of like an iconic sub. And there's a recipe in this book for my version of it. Mm, you almost flipped right to it. Oh, perfect. It's spread. Um, okay, wait, build me this sandwich. Okay, What's so I will. Here? So we've got like a crusty sesame loaf that has like some gives so that when you bite down into it, it does all the innards don't explode out. Then we have our fattiness in the form of all of these cured meats. And those are also where the saltiness comes in because they're cured and they're salty. And then we've got crunchiness in the form of mm. shredded iceberg and jardinera and like pickly things that have crunch and texture to them. And then that's where all of the acid is happening as well. So there's like the jardinera is like a pickle brine and then it's tossed with red wine vinegar. 
And then um, I have added Calabrian chili here because I like spicy sandwiches, but that's like how you build a like holistically balanced sandwich. I would have never thought that you're supposed to stack it in a certain way for crunch and all of that. That's yeah, very I mean, cool to know. The architecture of a sandwich is just as important as what's in it because yeah. like the eating experience can be ruined. Like in a, a really like simplified example of this is like when you get a burger and instead of the burger sitting on the tomato, it's sitting right on the lettuce. And by the time you eat it, the lettuce is hot and wilted. And you're like, why is the lettuce even here? Like yes. it's not doing its job. But if you put a tomato in between the patty and the lettuce, it's a barrier and the lettuce stays crisp. So like architecture. Okay, anywhere in the world, what is what is your favorite restaurant to eat at? The place I dream of and like will go back to every time I am there is um, called Chez Georges and it's in Paris. And it's a really, really old school steakhouse and it's really boisterous and it's, like a tiny little long corridor of a restaurant. Like you can barely make your way through the line of tables. And then you get sat in a booth and the man who runs the restaurant comes over and he like carts over um, a table side cart of pate and rillettes and pickles and bread and butter. And he just like takes a big scoop out of it and just like slops it onto your plate. And it's just like the most visceral eating experience and i already love paris like even if that restaurant didn't exist so to me that is like the one i love your vocabulary the way you describe <laughs> things i feel like i'm there with you oh okay rapid fire yeah for molly's more is more food is about flavors and recipes and culture and memories and uh, to me, I think so much is about nourishment. Like I said, yeah. how are you nourishing yourself right now, especially in this busy season? I am getting massages That's good. <laughs> and I am putting calendar invites on my calendar with my husband to do like seven to 10 minute walks around <laughs> our property, <laughs> which is so crazy that we have to, but like stepping out of the headspace mm -hmm. and going for a walk outside and like leaving the phones behind is everything I need to reset. I, in seven to 10 minutes, we'll do it. Yeah, totally. Can you beat Bobby Flay? Oh my God, I've never tried. <laughs> yes. If I don't know what wine to order, mm. what's like a, a basic thing I can ask for? I would say that the best way to approach like going into a restaurant and a wine list that you're just like, I don't even know is to ask the waitress, like give them your, use the vocabulary that you have available to you. And mm -hmm. it's like, are you in the mood for something like strong and bold and like in your face? Or are you feeling like light and ethereal? And like use other words to describe what you're looking for and let okay. the sommelier guide you towards a wine that like embodies that characteristic. That's great. What's a book that you've read that changed your life? Something you think everybody should read? Pretty much every of Ruth Reichel's books. Mm -hmm. um, I She's like been an idol for a really long time. Um, and growing up, I read all of her memoirs and just like got lost in the way that she describes food. It's just like interesting that you said your vocabulary because the way that Ruth Reichel describes the experience of eating is unlike anyone I've ever met. And so like for someone who's so curious about it, all of her novels are just like incredibly compelling. I think I have um, like an extra amount of uh, admiration for it because I did a morning show in Chicago and you constantly do food segments. Yeah. And you're trying to convey to the audience what you're tasting. Yeah. And I did not have the vocabulary it's for hard. it. It's hard. Like food is a whole different vocabulary. So when I like hear you saying it's bold and it's vibrant and it's visceral, I'm like, whoa. Yeah. You got <laughs> to like wonderful. get creative with the words you use. Otherwise yeah. it's like, it's yummy or like it's so salty. And it's like, that doesn't help us figure out what you're eating. At all. Yeah. yeah it's mouth watering. She it's uses not good. so many also metaphors, which like, I think she'll, she'll be like, it's like, the smell of rain on pavement in a parking lot after whatever. Ooh. And you're just like, oh my God, like as a way to describe like the finish of a wine or something. And you're yeah. just like, oh my God, like you just, it's emotional and it takes you there. Will you grab the card game right behind you? Yeah. Okay, so open it up. Okay. Choose a card that feels right to you. Just any card? Yeah. What's this one? That's the explainer. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
Okay. Should I read it out? Yeah, please. What is your earliest memory slash example of what success looked like? How did that impact you? Oh, you got a deep one. Very deep. This may not involve success as much as it does like self-assuredness and sense of self. But I, my brother growing up was like constantly reinventing himself Mm -hmm. and had like so many what we just like would call phases of like the way he kind of like held himself in the world and the way he dressed. And I think that it like instilled in me the realization that like you are never you're you are one person that has like a million different evolutions over the course of your life and that you can kind of continually reinvent yourself and it's not just like you're not stuck as like you in your time and so like while that's not like career success or financial success i think that's like to me a really successful sense of self or like way of seeing yourself in the world Shout out to my brother, Adam. That is really nice. Is he in New York? No, he's in LA. He's the best. Okay, last question. What is the smartest decision you've ever made? To move to LA, which happened accidentally. I'm a generally very happy person. Like I can find comforts and joys wherever I am. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I moved here that I really felt like I found my place. and, And I feel like joy environmental joy Mm -hmm. every day of my life and it feels like it has opened up so much in my life like so many new friendships and connections and work um pursuits and opportunities and it just like i feel like i pulled the curtain back so many people don't feel that when they move to la i know i think i'm always trying to convince people like it's really great i swear but i'm just like that's my experience i felt that way too you know yeah i landed here i didn't know anybody and i was like Yeah, this is my place. Yeah, we found our place. Yeah.